talk of C++ and CrossCon. Ha ha, I have a question. Sorry. Uh, this is Toby at the garden. They're going to talk about domain-specific languages or something like that. And then there's a little talk task. I have to crowdsource source to you. Um, we've got one microphone. The microphone is not for you. You won't hear anything loud. But there's this shiny camera. And there are some persons watching a web stream that want to understand what they say. So uh, when Toby interrupts Gordon, which he'll do pretty often, we have to make him take a microphone because otherwise those people won't understand him. So if you see that they do it and they don't change the microphone, <laughs> just tell them. I'll forget it, I won't see it, they'll forget it. That's what you've got to do. I'm, I'm pretty sure that will be an awesome talk if you all scream like, microphone! Yeah, that, that would fun. be really fun. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah of course. You, Oh, of course, you can also throw things. That is pretty fine. <laughs> okay, have fun with Okay, yeah, uh, welcome to uh, our talk here at uh, PHP at FrostCon is actually. So, who of you has no clue about PHP? Oh, you did, of course. <laughs> No, but it, no worries. The code examples we have are pretty, pretty, pretty easy. So it's it's valuable for all other uh, uh, programming languages too. So no worries here. Um, yeah. First of all, we want to introduce ourselves. I will start with that. My name is Toby. I got a degree in computer science and more than ten years of uh, professional PHP experience. I'm also pretty enthusiastic in open source and also in software architecture, software design, and stuff like. Uh, automated testing and things. And that is also the reason why I founded uh, a company named Quafu with uh, two of my friends. And what we do is we help teams to create high quality web applications in terms of uh, individual trainings for your team, uh, on-site consulting, uh, setting up your infrastructure with you, uh, helping you to get your projects right and stuff. So if you're interested on that, please don't hesitate to visit our website. Thank you. Um, I'm Gordon Oheim. Um, I'm a professional PHP developer as well. I've got more than 10 years experience, just like Toby. Uh, I, I'm pretty much interested in OA, OD, OOP, and lately in Agile and Lean topics. I'm a member of the PHP documentation team, so if you're going to PHP Manual, uh, you probably have read stuff I contributed to that, and I'm also an active Stack Overflow contributor. Uh, I'm a freelancer, and you can hire me if you like to. Yeah, uh, you should like, so. <laughs> we should have two presenters here. Anybody has another presenter with you? Uh, that is like, uh, yeah, this is, this is agile presenting, you know? Like having everything agile and adjusting everything to just the needs of the presentation. So, uh, first off. <laughs> First off, uh, we, we have a question here that is uh, DSL, what the fuck? So DSL is, of course, uh, uh, domain-specific languages. And who of you has ever used a domain-specific language? OK, I'm pretty sure on the next slide, or at least on the slide after that, everybody should raise his hands. So the first DSL we want to show you is that one. Anybody ever saw such, a, such an expression anywhere? It's true, it's a regular expression. It's, it's a Perl-compatible regular expression, actually, and that is some kind of domain-specific language. Why is it that way? It is a language which allows you only to do one thing, and that is text matching. It's not a general purpose uh, programming language which you can use to write whatever web application. It has very limited expressibility. So you cannot say whatever, if input is like that, then return something there and create a big object or something. It can only do text matching. And it's also embedded into other languages, like PHP, for example. So this is how Wikipedia uh, characterizes regular expressions. A flexible means to match, specific, uh, specify and recognize string text, blah, blah, blah. And that means it is coupled and is bound to a one specific domain, and that is text matching. Of course, that is a pure technical, do technical domain in that case. It's not like a business domain or whatever other domain. It's a pure technical domain. But in the end, it's a domain-specific language. Mm. Mm. <laughs> this one, probably everyone knows as well. That's SQL, which is another DSL probably all of you have used before. And um, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. It lets you query your database uh, with a specific dialect to do so. And 
It also has limited expressibility. Uh, it's also embeddable, like uh, regular expressions, into um, PHP. And the definition of Wikipedia is a special purpose designed for managing data in relational database management systems. So now we have seen two DSLs. The question is, can we abstract that to a somewhat higher level? And yes, we can. Martin Fowler actually defines uh, DSL as a computer programming language of limited expressiveness focused on a particular domain. What do we need that for? Well, yeah, let's do that first. Yeah, do you know more DSLs? Anyone? XSLT. XSLT, yeah. Yeah, more? Someone said that PHP is the DSL for the web. <laughs> yeah. PHP is the DSL for the web was, was the, uh, 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 the statement here. So. It, that is a somehow fancy quote, but in the end, yeah, PHP is a general purpose programming language, so that is why it cannot be a DSL. And of course, you can use PHP on the shell, uh, write GTK applications with it, uh, uh, write long running demons with it, so it's, it's not a DSL. But yeah, some people say PHP is a DSL for the web. So more. More DSLs. Markdown is, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, would don't, I wouldn't consider that a DSL actually, because in Markdown you can just uh, uh, write text and you cannot instruct a program what to do. It's, yeah, it's not a real programming language. Pardon? It's not like format? Yeah, it's, it's, more like, it's more like a text format. But yeah, we have written down some examples here. There is XPath. XPath is a, is a pretty typical uh, uh, domain-specific language because yeah, XPath can only do one thing. It can address XML nodes for you and it cannot do whatever, uh, cook coffee, for example. Uh, there is Ant. Ant is a domain-specific language for creating build processes. You cannot write web applications in Ant. Oh, maybe one people, uh, some people can in the future, but yeah, by now they can't. Uh, there is CSS. CSS might fall into the same category as Markdown, basically, but if you think more about that, CSS is a language to describe how your browser should present text content to you. So in the end, you instruct the browser, if you receive that command, then draw it like black and thick and draw it on the right side. And that is basically a DSL. Configuring your program in a pretty complex way uh, can be a DSL. Um, the difference to Markdown would be that um, with Markdown you structure the whole document, you create the whole document, but with CSS you just, well, format the HTML. So that would be the main difference, which makes CSS a DSL, but Markdown not, because it's a full package. We have GraphWiz, just to name some more. We have Java, of course. Yeah, Java, you know all this Java fancy stuff, which is a DSL. Any Java developers here? Any Java developers here? Yeah. Oh, there's only one. Yeah, you know oh. why it's a DSL, right? You know why it's a DSL, right? Yeah, yeah it's of course, Java is a domain-specific language it's to transform large XML files into stack traces. <laughs> <laughs> No, just kidding. It's just it's just about yeah. It's uh, the same as with PHP. Of course, Java is not the domain-specific language. Okay, so let's talk about why I created DSL. Um, it's easy to read and use. We can argue about regular expressions, but yeah, in general, it's easy to uh, read and use. This is not the argument. DSLs are great for business communication. Uh, mainly because you can express stuff in their language, which is usually not the language we talk, but with DSLs you have a perfect way to um, yeah, close the gap between business and uh, technical domains. Uh, you can simplify complex model adjustments, which Toby might want to say something about. Yeah, that is what I was talking about previously about CSS. Like, if you want to define how your browser presents certain HTML elements, uh, you could also write whatever, a C program or a PHP program or whatever your browser understands and configure hard code it like, uh, uh, if you receive an element like that and it's nested in an element like that and it's whatever on that and that page, then please apply the following properties, set the font size to that and so on. You can, of course, do that in a program programming language, and I'm pretty sure all of the browsers have APIs where extensions can hook in and tell them in a programming way to do it like that. But you have CSS, and nobody in the web world would ever 
think about doing that in a programming API to tell how an, XML, an HTML file should look like. So this is a very, very complex model inside your browser code, inside your browser implementation, there is a model of how a website should be displayed. And to configure this very, very complex model in an easy to read and write language, and that is yeah, a DSL for that purpose. And you can also pretty much ease your repetitive task with it, because just like Toby just said, if you have a very complex, uh, if you have to do very complex model adjustments, um, it's usually a lot of code, and with the DSL you can cut that down, and also down on the repetitive task with that, obviously. Um, it's very less, uh, much less expressive, and it's very noiseless, because when you use a DSL you don't have all the clutter of the general purpose language. In a general purpose language, you have stuff like uh, new and you have operators. You can have operators in a DSL as well, but you usually just focus on the stuff you want to express, and that makes it much easier and um, much more expressive and noiseless. You don't have the language stuff. I'm a little bit disappointed that nobody had to throw at us, so uh, we should try to not hand over the microphone next time oh, on, on purpose, just so somebody can throw stuff. Okay, um, so. The, the oh, oh. It's yours, yeah. good point. That's a question. Can you go one slide back? Please. Why do you say um, regular expressions is a DSL if almost none of these items apply to regular expressions? Like, for example, I think the only thing you, you can um, argue is that expressiveness is true for regular Okay. <laughs> okay. So the question was why we said that regular expressions are a DSL if almost none of the points here uh, uh, apply to regular expressions. And um, that, of course, depends on your view angle. Like, okay, it's, it's definitely not suited for business communication. That is just one reason why you might write a DSL, and we are coming to that in, like, a minute. But, of course, it's easy to read and use. Maybe not for you, but in the end, if you see the C code, which does the same thing than uh, a, a validation expression for email, then maybe the regular expression is way more easy to understand than the full C code. Maybe. At least the automaton, if you see that in full C code, it's, it's really, really less expressive and it's really, really less easy to read and write. So, in the end, it is somehow a domain-specific language and that is a valid point. Not all of these points need to be fulfilled by every domain-specific language. That is just reasons why you might want to create a domain-specific language on your own. Actually, um, yeah, you just uh, throw stuff at us. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, actually, I talked a lot about that uh, about regular expression with your brother. I also regularly told him I cannot read what you write there, but he says no, it's perfect. I can read it. <laughs> it's for him. It's very much. It's pretty go, easy. You can always read it in the other way, but DSLs are not for the technicians, but for the business people or users or whatever. Yeah. Um, you just said that um, it's, it's, it doesn't always apply, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, so external DSLs, which is what we just covered. You can embed external DSLs, but you don't have to. Um, the example we want to show you, uh, which does suit business communication, is Gherkin. Um, Gherkin is a business-readable DSL created especially for behavior descriptions. You use it for um, behavior-driven development, which means you can express um, business rules and um, ex preconditions and postconditions for your business domain with tests, and Gherkin allows the business uh, people to define um, the, the specs, actually. This is what it looks like. You have a feature, serve coffee, and then you have in order to earn money, customers should be able to buy coffee at all times. And there's a scenario, buy last coffee given there's one coffee left in the machine and I have deposited one dollar. When I press the coffee button, then I should be served a coffee. I'm pretty much sure every one of you understood what I just said and every non-techie can understand that as well. And um, yeah, that's the beauty of the DSL in this case. Because now your developers and the business people can communicate and say, well, our program should do this and that. and um, we don't have to bore them with stuff like, yeah, but you can't do that because we don't have gateway interfaces and stuff like that. And so that's one way um, to talk to them. Let's 
just to make that uh, one thing one thing clear. Oh, somebody screaming! Well, they don't throw stuff at us. No, they don't throw stuff. Oh, thanks. Um, just to make that clear, so the the domain specific language is basically that part. That is just documentation to explain what the use case should do, and that is the name of a scenario by Last Coffee, and that is what you explain in order to create an actually runnable test case against your application. And the basic idea here is that either you write down that stuff, what you understood, what your business owner wants you to do or wants your program to do, or that even one step further, your business owner can later on write such test cases by himself. And if you have the right stuff in place, then these test cases can just execute it against your program and you're done with verifying that your requirements are met. Um, of course, you just can't magically make things pop up from that language, so you need some sort of framework or at least some code uh, to make tests from that. And um, in PHP, Gherkin can be parsed with Behead, which is a BDD framework. It's inspired by Cucumber from the uh, Ruby people. And um, yeah, it allows you to run tests written in Gherkin. Uh, you can gra gra grab it at that uh, URL. This is how it looks like. Um, we just saw the feature here, feature serve coffee. This is a, um, you, you create a feature context for it. And then you have that given I am in a directory, and then something, which is the stuff you define. Uh, and then you define a function which translates what the people, the business people, um, defined as, um, as their conditions. And you write the, the test for that. And when you have the uh, test run, this is what will get executed. And then it will tell you if it passes or if it doesn't pass. We should definitely adjust these uh, uh, examples to match each other, because that is a different example than we had in the slide before, of course. Um, oh, the thing here is that, that this Gherkin language, which we just saw, like I'm going back to there if it works. This Gherkin language is actually not a language for your specific use case, but it just defines the meta grammar, like some kind of outer grammar for your domain-specific languages which you use in your test cases. So what Gherkin defines is just this given keyword. Yeah, In all your Gherkin statements, you have these given stuff, then you have when, and then you have then. So you have a precondition, uh, you have a, a test stimulus, like if I do something like that, and then you have an expectation. Then I would like to have something. And that is what Gherkin actually defines. So, uh, in order to use Gherkin in your project, you still need these feature contexts and still need to apply these regular exp expressions here to define your own language. Like in that case, we have given I am in a directory, match some directory. And if this sentence is discovered in your language, then this method is, ex is executed with this match as a parameter. Um, in the end, that means that, that this B hat stuff is not only one uh, domain specific language, but it's a meta domain specific language processor, which allows you to create your own domain specific languages for your own project and your own business domain, which is even, even higher than we wanted to talk in this talk, actually. But yeah. So if you want to write a domain specific language and an external domain specific language there is pretty much stuff to need to do you need to have uh, uh, your domain language like you need to define it what are the sentences what is this the uh, uh, the terminology of my language how should the language look like then you need to define the grammar at least at some stage uh, you will need that for the steps afterwards, which is a lexer and a parser, and then you have uh, some representation of your language in memory, and then you maybe need a compiler to compile it into a different general purpose language, or you need to apply the parse statements to your model, and that is like pretty much work. So it's a it's a pretty pretty nasty work to write a parser. This is a, an a extract of the uh, uh, Gherkin parser in Behat, and as we know, Behat just knows these uh, given when and then statements, which is a pretty, pretty small language, but you see the code is already getting massive, uh, messy down here. So if you've ever written a parser, um, that is stuff which you want to leave to your alpha nerds. Uh, some people enjoy that, but it's it's not the best idea to do in your uh, uh, customer project to like spend half a year of, of uh, manpower to just write a parser. So writing a parser for an external DSL is a pretty, pretty big hammer here. But there are ways around it, and Gordon knows one of, one of them. You don't always have to 
specify an external DSL, you can also, as a developer, ease your life by um, creating an internal DSL. And um, yeah, I did that in the past. I created a little tool which is called Interface Distiller, uh, which allows you to create interfaces from existing classes. So um, this is what it looks like. This is the semantic model. This is the exact term that um, Fowler uses in his book as well. Um, the semantic model is the stuff uh, which your DSL will translate into. Basically, it's the raw PHP code without any semantics that make it easier to use. As you can see, it's, as I can judge from your faces, it's not that easy to grasp at first sight. Um, what it does is you use the class and then you have a number of iterators, filter iterators, um, which will limit or filter the um, methods in that concrete foo uh, class to only contain um, methods that are not implemented, so only abstract methods and stuff, and it will remove those. Um, it will have uh, no, none of the old style constructors, so um, the Java style constructors. It won't have any magic methods, and um, yeah, that's what it does, actually. There's a second slide as well. Um, I will put all the methods then into a uh, distillate. I will call it foo interface. I will extend from iterator and seekable iterator. And in the end, I will write a new foo interface file and will distill the interface into that file. So from the input class, I will get a fine interface, actually. I actually need to repeat the joke we had last time there. Like w When we did that f talk for the first time, there was someone twittering afterwards uh, that is only, only suitable for German so yeah. So he was asking what the hell is uh, uh, the where it is? Is it here? Is it here? Yeah, yeah, oh, what what the Z cable iterator is. <laughs> <laughs> so I pro I promise you, when whenever you see that term again, you'll remember that joke. <laughs> okay, so the semantic model is your actual domain, which you want to apply the language later on. Um, it has a lot of syntactic noise, obviously. There was all this new stuff. There was filter iterator, and you have to know what you're doing there. So you have to be very low level. Um, there's no linguistic abstraction. It's just really just plain PHP code. Um, it's the basis for the language, yeah. And it follows general design principles. So it's pretty much just plain PHP code. Wouldn't it be nice if I wouldn't have to write that much stuff to uh, there's still an interface from a class? Yes, and that's why I built an expression builder on top um, of that semantic model, which looks like this, which is much more readable because now it gets across what it's doing much in a much more condensed style. So I can tell, okay, I want a new interface, I want only public methods, I want the Z-Kabel iterator, um, I don't want any implemented methods, I just want, um, I want to exclude inherited methods, I want no magic methods, I don't want old style um, constructors, I want to save it in this uh, file, foo interface, and um, yeah, I just distill now concrete foo into foo interface, and that's what it does. So if, if I've told you before, like this, this tool uh, is there to extract methods from an existing class and put that into an interface, and you would have this code, it would be way more easier for you to understand what happens in the background. Like, okay, we have this interface distiller. Uh, I want methods with, no, uh, with modifiers like that, extend interface from, uh, I want to exclude that. It's, it's way more readable for you than the code we had on the previous two slides, right? 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 <laughs> Is it true? Actually, I'm not really sure about it. <laughs> the code was quite readable, actually, for the other one. <laughs> Yes, but e uh, yeah, he said that the code was quite re readable before. Even if you apply clean code principles and make your methods and classes named properly, which helps readability tremendously, um, you still would not argue that this one is much more difficult to read. It's easy to read. It's, I mean, it's, it's condensed. And um, this is the language that I defined for the example. So on top of the semantic model, I now have a very small language which eases my development. Um, it captures the essential usage, um, it hides all the news and um, the, the iterator, the, the type stuff and stuff like that. Um, it's a semantic facade. 
just like the regular design pattern facade, it just captures the uh, um, semantics of what my model does. It's a fluent interface, someone just said that already, uh, which is a common pattern in uh, domain-specific languages. The main difference between uh, method chaining and fluent interface is that a fluent interface captures semantics so you can read it more like sentences, while method chaining just is just methods, one method after the other on the same object. And the fluent interface can span multiple objects or do whatever to make it more expressive. Um, it's a very pragmatic implementation. The code for the interface distiller is on GitHub. It's not that pretty. Um, that's mainly because you have to violate some um, solid principles and other design principles to make it work. Like um, a fluent interface basically always uh, violates um, law of Demeter. And yeah, this is a trade-off. But the good thing is I have it um, isolated in that facade and then it's fine. That is also one thing which is really common to if you want to implement your own domain specific language for your project. You have on the one side you have your domain model, your business model, which is really which should be really really good code, which should be extensively tested, uh, and which should apply all the quality standards which you ha want to have in your project. Of course, you also want to test that your external uh, uh, DSL or your internal DSL compile into the correct output so that you don't misconfigure your uh, domain model in the end. But it is somewhat okay-ish to not implement the parser and lexa and whatever stuff in, in uh, uh, all the principles of good object-oriented design. I would, I would even say it's not really possible to do so without tremendous effort. You know, most parsers nowadays uh, uh, choose, use just like go-to statements. And that, that is why you can easily write a parser in PHP, because we have go-to. Another nice addition to the interface distiller would be if I could use an, um, a CLI interface, command line interface. And if you have the expression builder already, it's pretty easy um, to come up with code that assembles the semantic model um, below. And yeah, there's a CLI interface for that, which pretty much does the same thing, same thing as the um, expression builder. So it's, you also have a nice addition if you have, uh, you ease your development if you have um, some sort of DSL, because it's again less clutter to um, to write. There is some more examples. The good thing about the interface distiller is that it's a pretty small example. Um, there are more complex examples, like for instance um, Zeta SQL abstraction, which Toby wants to talk about. And yeah, that is the typical use case where you might have already seen such uh, 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 such internal DSLs. It's, uh, you want to create some kind of expression in, in some object uh, uh, representation, and instead of creating the objects and nesting them into each other and needing to know uh, which constructor needs which parameters and stuff, you have a wrapped... Uh, uh, wrapped it into such a fluent interface. And in this case, we are doing SQL abstraction. So we are trying to generate SQL, which is independent from the underlying database. And we are using this fluent interface for that. So uh, we have an SQL query and on the, uh, well, which is a select query and we do update. Oh, that is, that is of course a typo, which, uh, uh, which was introduced by extracting it. Okay, we have an update query, of course, which I'll update this uh, uh, um, table there, we set some fields, we bind some values, and we put some expressions into there, like create an AND expression. Inside the AND expression, we have an equals expression, and we have two parts which are equal and stuff. So this is way more easy to read than having all over the place, like a uh, uh, new update query with new update matcher or new update columns and all that things. Yeah, another example would be mockery, uh, which is a mocking framework for PHP, so for your tests, if you um, need mocks, then you can use that pretty much. And um, you can also use PHP units, uh, mockery uh, stuff, of course. And um, yeah, it's again pretty easy to read. So instead of wiring the object graphs together manually, I have this semantic facade again, where I can do stuff like, um, this is a starship, actually, new starship. And it needs some sort of engineering um, and then you just test the expectations like it disengages warp, it diverts power um, with these params in that order. Yeah, and then your tests become quite readable actually. Okay. Uh, you don't always have to write a parser. 
Um, you can also abuse other languages like XML or YAML because they come with a parser right from the start, which is quite handy. Um, yeah. So I've also written an example for that one. Um, I've, if you will see that on the next slide. In our presentations at Quafu, we are using quite a lot of code to, to show people uh, how stuff looks like in code and not only explain it to them in, in, in a theory uh, background. And therefore, we have uh, a, a simple tool which we use in LaTeX to highlight code lines. Like, uh, just to show you what that means. So, uh, you see, this is the line I'm talking about, and these are the next lines I'm talking about. So, that works pretty fine in LaTeX, but um, there's a problem if we do longer trainings. Like, in a full day training, I want to show longer code examples. And putting them on one slide is really, really hard, especially if you want to show code side by side. Like, this is the test code, and this is the real code which is tested. So what we needed was something where we can scroll and where we can whatever uh, pop stuff off and on and, and, and go forward and backward more easily and zoom into some places and zoom out of some places. So I've written a little tool which creates such presentations in HTML for us. Um, now that you see how it works, it should be, at least for a technician, not so hard to understand what this DSL means. We have a base directory where our code which we want to present is located. Uh, then we have a first presentation part, so we're first presenting the file example bhead.php. And from this file, we only want to display these lines, like lines 2, 8, 9, uh, 20, uh, and 9 to 21. I don't know if this is continuous. Yeah, this is continuous, actually. So these would be lines 1 to t uh, 14 displayed here. And then we want to define highlights. On the first slide, I want to highlight line 9, line 10, and line 21. On the second slide, I want to highlight line 11 to 13. On the third line, uh, uh, slide, I want to highlight, and so on. And then we have a second, uh, a, a second slide, w a second file which is presented, which has also defined which, which lines to, uh, uh, to show at all on the slides, and then defines which lines to highlight on the slides. That might be already a little bit complex, but yes, if you look into the PHP code which would be necessary to define that, that is even harder. So, as you can see, and this is only the first slide basically, these are not two slides, this is only the first slide. I needed to reduce the font size and it's way less readable. I have stuff like, I need a code manager which manages my code. I have a slide generator, listing slide generator. It needs the code manager and it needs the file name. Uh, it also needs a display filter for, uh, uh, for that file name, like, oh, what is to display? Oh, in order to define uh, um, this display filter, I need a range. This range is located in a different namespace. Um, the range receives like uh, 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 either numbers or it receives arrays of numbers. The array of number I'm creating with the range function in PHP, and so on. I need to know all these fancy details on how to create these objects. I need to know in which place and which line, uh, uh, in which constructor I can put which stuff. I maybe have an IDE which can tell me, oh, you need something like a highlight filter here or a display filter here, but I still don't know which one I want to use. So in the end, this is way more complex creating such stuff if you only want to render out such a presentation. And it's a, ta a task I will do in my daily work. Whenever I prepare a training, I would start writing such stuff just in order to do generate three slides which show me, show me some code example up here. So this is, this is a very, very sensible place for me to create a domain-specific language which is, damn, that doesn't react that good as mine does, which is way more expressive, which has way less noise around it just from the, from the uh, uh, general purpose language I would otherwise be using, and which eases the repetitive use of my, uh, uh, the repetitive execution of the task of generating a new presentation. And the nice thing is, uh, the syntax of that file is just YAML. So I just took the Symfony YAML parser, I tol told it, oh, uh, take that YAML and parse it, and then I have a nice array structure which I'm applying a visitor to to generate my model out of it, and I'm done. You're doing a pretty good job. Okay, yeah, so to sum it up, um, DSLs are, where is it? It's not on the slide. Yeah, we got oh. them, but it's after that. It's after that? <laughs> <laughs> So, um, the last time we gave that talk, there was a question that if, 
each configuration, uh, every configuration you have, is it a domain-specific language? What would you say? No. Ooh. <laughs> That's a pretty good answer. The answer was no. Exactly. That is exactly the thing. The qu the answer was. <laughs> Why are you holding up a slide which says, "Please repeat the question"? When you gave an answer, actually. <laughs> yes, I will repeat it because it's pretty pretty much on our slides. No, not every configuration is automatically a domain-specific language because it misses semantics and ex misses expressiveness. A configuration file, like an any file, is just a thing of key-value pairs. There is no semantics in it. Uh, you have no clue uh, in which way these key value pairs are coupled together, which influence each other, and all that things. That is all missing from, from your configuration file. So not every configuration file is a DSL. But there is, of course, a fluent transition between that. Because if you see like uh, uh, huge XML configuration files, which uh, uh, um, configure uh, dependency injection containers, for example, uh, then that might, of course, be a domain-specific language because you are putting together objects and have a semantic a, a semantics in I'm depending on an object which is named like that, and I want to have multiple instances of these objects, and all these stuff is wrapped together. Although there is a pretty nifty discussion of if, if XML is a suitable base language for DSLs, right? Yes. Yes, but um, Fowler says it's okay, so... <laughs> we have to take his word for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so to sum it up further, DSLs can greatly enhance your life. Um, you, it can ease your business communication. Uh, it simplifies your complex repetitive tasks and it's expressive and noiseless, basically all that we just said, and you can make configuration much more easier in your code. And um, you don't need a DS external DSL in the first place because you can just create your internal DSL on top of your regular code to ease your development. Um, just create your semantic model, uh, create your internal DSL. Um, maybe use XML or YAML or whatever other format you think suits it. Um, you can create an EBNF parser and a parser generator, this is for the external, sorry, um, to parse your language or to automatically generate stuff from it. But yeah, you don't need an external DSL in the first place. They are not a golden hammer, although we showed you a hammer. You might remember it wasn't golden, and um, that will put it in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, coming back to that, um, that is the, the typical way of how you create a DSL in your project is, uh, as far as I know, is that way. Because typically you already have communication in place with your business owner and then you start creating it like that and easing your the task of uh, for your own and then you might switch to using really a formal language to describe your business processes um, it might be the case that if you're starting a greenfield project um, that you want to create a dsl as the first thing and the reason for that might be that you will deal with a highly complex business domain and want to involve your business owner as much as possible into the project and as early as possible in the project. If you do that, you are already on the way of defining the terminology of your full project, of defining roles in your project and all that stuff. And when you're once on that way and yet you have the possibility to, to sell it to your business owner that this might be a sensible adjustment here, then you can just start by defining your own language with, together in close relation with your business owner and then do it the other way around. Defining the language first and then implementing your project the other way around, like having a parser for your language and then uh, making the, the resulting structure in memory uh, fit your business model and execute the code. That is a completely different approach to what we've shown here, but it's also a valid way of doing stuff. Five minutes. Damn, we are really underdue. I was really thinking we will be overdue. So, but still finished. Are there any questions? Um, what's the difference between a, a nice interface for a specific problem and uh, internal DSL? Because this internet, uh, interface tester just seems like a nice API and I couldn't distinguish why it's a DSL, DSL or why it's just a nice API. 
Yeah, the question was, um, why it was is the interface distiller uh, example we just showed, why it, is, why it is not just a nice API, but why is it a semantic model uh, or a DSL? And the key element is basically the semantic model because it expresses what the underlying code does. So it's, this, um, it's a linguistic abstraction of what is below. And if you have a nice API, it's not usually a linguistic abstraction. It's not on the language level, but it's basically just on the usage level. Maybe this is just the, uh, uh, the thing which we talked about right before the talk here in front. Um, if you have a nice API, like this Fluent interface to configure your distiller, uh, that is a nice API, of course. I like th such APIs, I like it if I'm presented like that. And what I now understood is that it's basically building up a DSL on basis of my original model in order to make the API nicer. So that is just an, a good observation that uh, building an additional API on your main business model, which looks like it, uh, which is easier to use, which is more expressive, is already creating some kind of DSL, at least if you do it right. That may be the case, that uh, most of you already created DSLs by accident, yes. At least internal ones. More questions? Okay, next time we even need more examples. Which is pretty hard because in the PHP world there are not that many DSLs to be found by now. How many of you think they have developed a DSL actually before? We didn't ask that before. So, got the Java guy. <laughs> <laughs> With Groovy. With Groovy. <laughs> Again, I'm oh, sorry. I uh, developed an actual Groovy. Groovy or Ruby? DSLs. What Was it Groovy or Ruby? Groovy. <laughs> nice. Groovy. I think it was Groovy. groovy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any others? You did it yourself. In, in which, yeah, which, for what purpose? Yeah. Um, uh, for describing um, functional architecture of a robotic system and um, developed in FPS. I don't know if you know that meta programming system. So just repeat it. Uh, you wrote a DSL for functional programming. No. Functional, no. Specification. functional specification of robotic something. Robotic something. <laughs> Robotics, architecture. Robotics architecture. Okay. Repeat the TLA used MPS. MPS meta programming system. That's a um, um, application to develop DSLs, but in projection. So projection of editors for DSLs. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Any more? I mean, if you have used internal DSLs in the past, now that you know what they look like, who of you is using who of you is using PHP Unit? Or a database abstraction layer? Or yeah, like ZenDB, Selector, the easy stuff, and so on. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I want to repeat that, please. Who of you is using PHP Unit? Okay. Who of you has ever created a mock in PHP Unit? Okay, all of you have used internal DSLs. It's just like mockery is pretty much the same than the, the interface in PHP Unity create mocks. So that is just also an abstraction to create all the, the magic inside the mock, which does all the things like, oh, I need to, to expect a parameter here. I need to create a parameter matcher on the first place. And all that stuff is just wrapped into a yeah, discussionable uh, DSL on basis of these method chaining. Okay, yeah. If there are no more questions, oh, there is. write your own um, DSL. The first one was um, I'm using Play PHP with uh, root interface. The second one was um, I'm using uh, YAML. And the third one was like uh, making the big parser and put it on top of your external language. And that is basically, yeah. The qu I'm sorry, the question was that we basically presented two ways of uh, creating a DSL, which was a fluent interface and abusing an another language, another external language, which was YAML. 
and I replied to that that we also had the first thing, which was creating a real external language and then having a parser and lexer and stuff to process it. But yeah, the further question. Like to write a really simple DSL like <coughs> a DSL for filters on, on messages of some, some kind. Mm. Um, what method would you use? Would you start with a very big one? I guess not. Would you use the YAML style? Would you mm. use the true interface style? Okay, the question is if, if I want to write a very simple DSL, like for example filtering messages, which approach would I take? Um, I think I would go exactly that way. Like the first thing is to have a semantic model, to have an object representation of my filters, which I can apply to whatever a message queue or wherever you want to apply that or apply to single messages. And then is the question, uh, what do you need the DSL for? If you want people to write these filters which are not familiar at all with your project, like uh, you have a, a, a pretty cool email client written in whatever language and then you want people using that email client to be able to write these these filter rules then you end up with something like that in the down here so you need to define the language and you need to to create a parser and lexer and all that stuff because you want to make these people it as easy as possible to create these filter rules with your domain specific language and these are pretty much all non-programmers which are using this email client, so you cannot expect them to be able to write such stuff at all. So you also want to put an IDE with auto-completion on it, which shows them there is something wrong, or a nice graphical interface which you can use to click that stuff together and things. So in that case, I would clearly go for, for the last uh, uh, approach. If, on the other hand, you want to have these filter rules just for uh, uh, your own little tool, which you are selling to customers in a specific configuration, then it's it's as easy just writing a, a, a fluent interface on top of that and hacking the fluent interface or using whatever XML or YAML as an external language to to parse this stuff. It was, always depends on who your target audience is of the DSL, basically. Um, so maybe a second question. Um, um, the question was how much effort does it take um, to create a DSL uh, yes of course the parser Lexa stuff takes the most effort especially if you create your language from scratch and um, can't fall back um, on parser generators or use something which there is a language parser for already. Um, so, yeah, I'd say the internal DSL takes the, less, the least effort and then rising up to the um, external DSL, which takes the most effort. But of course, it depends again, because you can put, yeah, basically infinite effort into um, an internal DSL as well. It just depends on how much uh, you want to abstract it into a readable language. Common mistakes. Um, what are common mistakes? The question was, what was common mistakes? What are common mistakes? Well, there can go a lot of stuff wrong, but I don't know any particular. Do you know any? In the end, the hardest part of, of that thing is to find is the language itself. Yeah. So uh, if, it, it, there might be problems where you already have a, a language in, in your mind before you actually start the project. Like for your filter stuff, I could imagine like you already have in mind uh, how filters should basically look like. Uh, but still, there are problems in, in this language design, especially if you want to use an external language. Uh, uh, you need to have some constraints applied to your language in order to make it easily possible. So it should be a context-free grammar in, in the end for, for people knowing that, that uh, uh, terms. And that is stuff which you need to keep in mind and which you need to... Uh, uh, need to verify during language construction, then you have the problem that your language should be extensible. You don't know if in one or two years uh, the language still uh, covers all of the stuff which you want to do, so you need to be extensible, you need to be able to apply new rules without uh, rewriting the whole language and rewriting the whole parser and stuff. What can else go wrong there? That is, that is basically what, what can go wrong. If you're on the internal DSL thing, uh, 
fixing stuff that goes wrong is pretty easy or is, is easier than on the external side. Because, yeah, you just need to refactor some code. Maybe use an IDE and tell it, oh, please rename that method, or uh, uh, I change whatever objects which are nested here and the output stays the same. But, yeah, the greatest risk is that your, your domain model basically changes and that your language needs to change then. And, yeah, then you run into the, the typical legacy shit, so to say. If you want to make version 2 of your uh, nice program and have a really big DSL in it, and now you want to change the DSL, all of your customers will kick your ass because you need a migration path from the old language to the new one, which is uh, a funny thing, <laughs> funny thing to do. That's typically the case for template languages, for example. If you have a project which is 15 years old and now you want to make a shiny new version, whatever, and want to change the template language, your customers will go mad. Actually, one thing that can go, well, that could possibly go wrong, is um, when your DSL starts, or your your um, linguistic abstraction starts to um, to permeate into the uh, semantic model. So you don't, you just want to have the semantic model, a clean, regular PHP code representation of what you're doing, and you don't want to have the DSL go change. You don't want to write code inside the semantic model um, that is completely dependent uh, on the on the external stuff or on the um, linguistic abstraction. You just want it the other way around because the DSL benefits your semantic model, not the other way around. I ju just remembered one thing which can also go wrong, and that is that your your DSL slowly creeps into being a full blown programming language. Um, or that you start even embedding full-blown programming languages into your DSL. One example for that is ANT. ANT is this build system tool where you can use XML to configure how your build steps look like. And what they did some time ago in ANT was allowing to embed JavaScript into ANT. So that means you don't have to write external extensions to ANT anymore. You can just write JavaScript code into your build files and they're executed as your ANT tasks. And if you reach that stage, then you might think, oh, there is something wrong. So if you have JavaScript execution in your filter language, there might be something wrong with the language at all. There are actually other embedded languages as well. So there are other scripting languages oh, okay. that are embedded there as well. You can use so there are, uh, seem to be other languages which are already embedded into ANT. So my, maybe in the future you can uh, uh, extend your build targets with PHP in ANT, which might look somewhat funny. Okay, so you just need to implement a new script manager for ANT and then uh, uh, bind PHP to it and you're done, which is uh, nice. It's kind of crazy, but it work. Okay. Time's up. Time's almost up. Thanks for listening. I hope uh, you liked it a little bit. Enjoy FrostCon. Bye. Das war wirklich schnell.